Welcome to Lador Vidor's Touch of Torah with Rabbi Barry Silver. Today is Tuesday, July 11th, and we are so pleased to have Rabbi Barry with us again. Um, we've had to take a back seat for uh, Touch of Torah for a few weeks. Tonight, we're going to be talking about numbers, two parshas, Matot and Masay. And take it away, Rabbi Barry. Thank you very much, Sharon. It's great to be here with you to uh, talk about the uh, Torah passage. And we have some others who are on with us, and we'll be glad to hear from them as well. Uh, as you may know, uh, as the rabbi of Congregation Lador Vador, we uh, take a view towards the Bible that's a rational perspective. We believe the Bible has some great things in it, wonderful teachings, a vision of the future, idealistic dreams of the prophets, but it also has some things that are rather primitive that we've outgrown. This passage, both of these passages, have a little bit of each, which represents the reason why I have filed a challenge to ban the Bible from the public schools in order to indicate that we don't like book banning, but if you're going to do it, then you have to do it in an even-handed way. Uh, these passages indicate why the Bible is at the top of the list for some of the most offensive passages in all literature, as well as some of the most enlightening. So let me share a little bit about these passages. Uh, the, the passages describe the Jewish people's conquest of the promised land. So according to the Torah, God promised the land of Israel to the Jewish people. And he also wanted to make sure that the land was purified. Because this was the promised land that God was giving to his people, as an example to the world of how people should behave, he did not want any type of impurity in the land. It had to be wiped out, which means that people who worshiped other gods also, according to the Torah, had to be eliminated or wiped out. It wasn't a matter of converting them. It was a matter of committing genocide against them. And so in this passage, Moses is ordered to eliminate the Midianite people. Uh, which is kind of unfortunate since his uh, father-in-law was a Midianite. Uh, so Moses goes ahead and carries out God's instructions through his generals and wipes out the people of Midian, but he leaves the women alive. And God is not pleased at all. God said, I told you to wipe out all the people. Why did you disobey me? Uh, Moses apologized and then went ahead and exterminated the women as well, except he kept 16,000 women alive who were virgins. Uh, how he determined that they were all virgins, the Torah doesn't describe, but we can also imagine what purpose he had for keeping these particular women alive. So this is one of those passages that we modern Jews repudiate and reject. And it's one of many reasons why we don't believe that a divine authority, all good and all loving, wrote these uh, particular passages. There's another part of the uh, of this these uh, two passages that is much more uh, enlightening and uplifting. Um, it also has to do, unfortunately, with the conquest of the land, but there's a, a redeeming value in it. What happens is two of the tribes. Reuben and God. It's not God up in heaven. It's a, you could pronounce it Gad if you want. But anyway, two of the tribes said to Moses, we uh, are cattle people. This was the, these were the first cowboys ever mentioned in literature. We're cattle people. And we noticed that the land that we already passed through in Jordan, the, the, this is cattle country. And so we like it here. We don't really want to cross over the Jordan into Canaan and have to go around fighting all these people to conquer the promised land because we're perfectly happy right here. So how about if we just stay here and you guys go and, and fight all the battles? So Moses was very displeased and he said, how dare you suggest such a thing? How dare you say that your brothers should go and fight and you're just gonna stay here out of the fray? He said, this is the type of thing that I've seen over and over again from this past generation. That's why you had to wander for 40 years in the desert, because you refused 
to cooperate and to work as a team. So they said to Moses, well, how about this? How about if we go ahead and help you to fight and conquer the promised land, but then afterwards, when the fighting is over, how about if we return to this part of the, the territory and we settle here? Moses said that was a good idea. He was perfectly happy with that. And so that was the arrangement that was made. And then uh, they were back in the good graces of Moses. So the, the passage teaches us the importance of working as a team. When the Jewish people have all joined forces together, working for a good cause, we've been able to accomplish great things. When Jewish people don't work together and we uh, don't talk to each other or have difficulty joining in coalition for a common cause, we've always done very poorly. The classic example of that was in the Roman conquest of Judea, when the Romans were gathered around the gates of Jerusalem and were threatening to unleash the most horrific carnage that our people had known and start 2,000 years of exile from the promised land. Instead of the Jewish people joining together to fight off the Romans, they fought each other. They were killing each other, arguing over doctrinal differences and which was the real Messiah and which philosophy was the best one. And then it was very simple for the Romans to just come in and mow down the Jews because they fought against each other. We call that in Hebrew, sinat chinam. It means gratuitous hatred and enemy and enmity for one another. This is something that our people have learned the hard way. We should try to avoid, and instead we should cooperate. Uh, today, the Jewish people haven't really learned our lesson. We still don't talk to each other too much. Despite our best efforts, it's hard to get people who are Orthodox or Chabad to ever set foot in our synagogue. We have had some, but in general, especially the Chabad, don't want to have anything to do with us. And uh, many groups won't talk to other groups. We at Lador Bador invite and welcome dialogue. Everyone is welcome. We invite the Orthodox, Chabad, conservative, humanistic, all Jews. We invite them to come and join with us and participate in dialogue and celebrations and in the festivities. And to some extent, we've succeeded in that. We have done a lot of networking with fellow Jews and with people of various religions. And uh, if anybody's watching out there and you'd like to, you know an Orthodox rabbi or a Chabad rabbi who would like to engage in dialogue, they are always most welcome at Lador Vador. Uh, so those are my comments. I'd now like to open it up to see if anybody uh, would like to share some of their uh, observations or some of their discussion about these two uh, passages. Anybody want to share some thoughts? Um, Sharon, you have anything you'd like to add to uh, my commentary? Oh, yeah, everybody's on move. Oh, I no. see. I think. Yeah, yeah everybody's on move. Anybody want to share anything, or if you want, I can keep uh, keep chatting about the passage. Oh, I see we have a new uh, guest also who just popped in. Well, let me just apply this to today. Uh, today, we have many progressive organizations fighting for good causes, such as abortion rights or gun control or protection of the environment, health, education. And a lot of these groups are operating in isolation. Uh, so I've put together a coalition called PROTECT. It stands for Progressive Resolute Organizations Together Enthusiastically Combating Tyranny, Protect Democracy. And these groups are now joining together in coalition so we can work together to promote these wonderful causes. Uh, we're planning an event on August 2nd at the Civic Center, where we'll be discussing many of these issues and what we can do working together as a team in order to be victorious and fighting for things that uh, are consistent with Jewish 
values and ideals. And so it's really important that you stay tuned to our website at ladorvador.org so you can see what's going on and participate in a coalition in order to uh, fight for Jewish ideals. Coming to the synagogue and participating in the discussions is awesome. And uh, if you can also go out into the community and put these ideals into action, that's uh, even better. So you're all welcome to do that. And uh, for details, just go on to Ladorvador, L-D-O-R-V-A-D-O-R dot org. And for that, I have to share, uh, thank Sharon for among many other things that she does for putting things up on our website and letting people know how they can get involved. Um, I'm actually uh, having to leave this discussion early because I'm being inv I'm involved with the Sierra Club tonight, and we're going to discuss how we can protect the Ag Reserve. And uh, if, you're, if that issue matters to you also, please stay tuned to our website to see how you can get involved. Um, anybody at all want to share any thoughts or observations before we uh, sign out? I, I just want to, wanted to say that um, we're very interested in um, the Oppenheimer uh, thing you put together. So, um, Sharon, Thank you very much for, Alan and yeah. I will probably participate in that. Well, thank you very much for reminding me about that. Yes, we're going to be showing the movie Oppenheimer Saturday, July 22nd, approximately 7 o'clock. Also, stay tuned to our website to find out the exact details. It's an incredible movie. A real, really educational, inspirational, and um, enlightening about World War II, the development of the atom bomb, the role of the Jewish people in uh, scientific advancement, and then the effort to try to restrain the use of these weapons. Um, very, very interesting discussion will ensue from that movie. And uh, thank you, Gloria, for reminding us. I hope everybody will be there. It's going to be shown at the Movies of Del Rey which is on Atlantic Avenue and Hagen Ranch. And um, they do a lot of great work showing important movies and encouraging discussion. We're also going to be showing the movie Golda about Golda Meir in August. And you're all invited to come to that as well and also to be part of that discussion. Thanks, Gloria. Um, anybody else? Yeah, Rabbi, I just, I want to talk about how in this, in this portion, in the first half of it, it's it's a very violent God that we're dealing with, a very unfair, unfeeling God that we're dealing with. And it seems like it's repeated through the Torah again and again and again. And you tend to downplay it, I think. Um, but it, I find it very disturbing. Um, well, you could say I downplay it. I, I actually confront it. You um, confront many, it. Many rabbis, you know, Many rabbis gloss over it and try to explain it or rationalize it or justify it. I, I confront it, I recognize it, I reject it, and I repudiate it. And I indicate that this is one of the reasons why we know that God or an infallible all good being didn't write the Bible. So I confront it head on. And I often uh, bring up such passages and often bring it up in discussions and debates. So. I, I haven't really too much been accused of downplaying it. I've, I've been accused of the opposite, of dwelling on these things too often and bringing up the negative. But if you'd like, I'll be glad to go into more detail about it. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I happen to agree with you, Alan, that the, the God of the Torah is a very vicious, violent, intolerant God who uh, orders genocide throughout throughout the Torah. And so that, that's why Lador Bador espouses a view that unites Judaism and science and rejects the view that this that our Torah was written by God. We, we accept the view that like everything else, religion has to be given room to evolve. That when science first began, it made a lot of huge, huge errors. It, it didn't know anything about the germ theory of disease and didn't know anything about the earth not being the center of the universe and didn't know anything about how everything got here through evolution. It was completely ignorant. But science is very, very successful 
because it evolves, it learns and it grows. And if religion was allowed to evolve and learn and grow, then it too could be highly successful as a moral force. When it doesn't grow, doesn't evolve, and it harbors the delusion that God wrote the Torah and therefore it is infallible, that's when the trouble begins. And that's why human beings are still killing each other over ancient literature. So in case there's any doubt about where I stand, I, uh, I reject this type of God, and I believe that it's responsible for a lot of violence, and therefore, as a religious leader, I feel obliged to repudiate that and to uh, offer uh, a more evolved understanding of religion. Um, Alan, did you want to add anything further about, about that? No, I think that I think that you share um, your feelings all along. You've been sharing your feelings about that. I didn't mean I didn't mean to say that you downplay it as a. It, it wasn't meant as a criticism at all. No, it, I understand. It, you did. I, I understand. You, 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 but tonight I did kind of gloss over it and say, well, you know, he did authorize genocide. But but you're right. I shouldn't do that. <laughs> I, I agree with you, Alan. This is something that is uh, very offensive and also uh, justifies murder today. And so we have to make sure that we voice our righteous indignation about this. But we also want to make sure that we express the, the hope that people will look at the Torah and Jewish history within an evolved sense of how we started, how far we've come, and the ideals of the Torah, the ideals of living in peace and harmony and justice and fairness, which were recited at an embryonic stage, paved the way for our people to be the moral conscience of the world and have allowed the Jewish people to always stay one step above and to set the standard for, for morality. And we still do that today. And the movie Oppenheimer brings that forward, even after we helped to develop the new uh, nuclear weapons to help defeat the Nazis, which was a very important thing. The Jewish people then spent their time and these scientists worked very hard to try to restrain the use of nuclear weapons. Unfortunately, they weren't successful in it, but they did their best to try to help the world see the danger in nuclear proliferation. And as Jews, we still need to make sure that the world understands that and do our best to try to restrict and limit and reduce the nuclear weapons in the world so that hopefully there will be none left. Go ahead, Sharon. I wanted to ask a question. Um, I know the humanists, um, I'm not sure their view of the Torah. I know they don't stand for the Torah. They don't kiss the Torah. They don't pay homage to the Torah. But what would a humanist, um, what would their view be of all the killing and genocide within the Torah? What would their view uh, specifically from the humanist point of view? Be? Well, that's why they're humanists. They, they're appalled and aghast at the uh, moral outrages in the Torah and the killing. You see, many, many religious leaders just ignore it or they explain it and they say, well, you know, this had to be so that we could purify the land of Israel. They justify it. Or they say, well, God knows better than we do. So if God ordered it, it must have been okay. Um, the humanists don't do that. They, they do what Alan's suggesting we should do and what we do at Lador Vador. They, they're appalled at it. And that's why they don't consider the Bible to be a, a sacred book at all. They don't consider it to be sacred in any way. They consider it just to be literature and rather primitive and barbaric literature at that. So that's why. They don't, they don't revere the Torah. Um, they do read from it at the bar mitzvahs, but they're kind of, I guess they have uh, ambivalence towards the Torah. They read from it, but they also, well, they certainly reject it as God's word because they don't believe in God, but they're, they're pretty appalled by that. And also the unscientific things in the Torah. And they, they take a pretty dim view, really, of the Torah, which, which differs from Lador Vador. We revere and cherish the Torah, not because it was written by an infallible being, but because it was written by fallible beings growing and learning and striving to become more moral and to understand the universe and understand our place in it and to try to understand how we can live in peace with each other. And we also revere it because people gave their lives 
defending it for a dream, a dream of the prophets of a better world. The humanists tend not to see those types of things. They're, they're, they see very clearly some of the uh, horrors in the Torah, and that definitely covers their view of it. Um, anybody else? Well, I think it's been a great discussion. I thank all of you for being part of it. And I encourage you, stay with the website. Keep involved. we got a lot of great activities coming up, a lot of fun things happening. And thank you, everybody, for participating.